And that debasement is, is a major source of paying for war. You're not going to have a populace that's upset because they're just, they're just being duped. They're not seeing that showing up. Uh, let's say their tax rate is, is 25%. And if you weren't debasing the money, it might be as high as 35 or 45%, right? If you would raise those taxes on the people and say, hey, we're raising the taxes for the next five years by 20% to pay for this war because we're really mad at these people over here, you're probably not going to go to war. This episode of Bitcoin People proudly brought to you by Looking Glass Education, bringing you easy to read, beginner friendly financial education that helps you take control of your financial future. And it's all free, so go check it out. Hello and a huge, fabulous, warm welcome. Very excited to have on board with me today, Preston Pish. Welcome to Bitcoin People. Hey, great to be here. Excited to be here. Excited to have you on board. There is so much to you, Preston. There's so much in in your life story, in your uh, life prior to investing, your life prior to podcasting, then you've got this kind of whole second phase of life, which is the podcasting side. And now I kind of want to call it a third phase, which is your Bitcoin notoriety. Would that be fair to yeah, say? I think that is fair to say. I, I like that. It's kind of come in three phases. Yes. You're kind of like the Joe Rogan of the Bitcoin world because he had his life as the MMA fighter and then he had his life as the comedian, the stand up comedian, and now he's got his life as a podcaster. So I'm going to equate you to the Joe Rogan of the I'll Bitcoin world. I'll take that. <laughs> Carrie, I'll take it all day. <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to start with is I want to take you back in time. Uh, I want to maybe not, we, we can get into a bit of upbringing if you like, but what intrigued me as I read Diary of a West Point Cadet, one of the things or a couple of things that many things intrigued me, but in your very early days was that you wanted from very early on, you were very clear that you wanted to be a, an attack helicopter pilot. Mm -hmm. Why was that so clear and so strong for you? What was the appeal? I, I wanted to fly. Um, I, I thought I wanted to fly attack just because it was more adventurous, I guess, would maybe <laughs> I would answer that. Um, but I even even going into flight school, I think when I went to flight school, I was thinking I was going to fly attack. And then when I was in flight school, I kind of changed my mind. I was maybe going to fly lift and fly Blackhawks. And then when it kind when it came down to time to choose, I went back to the original uh, attack helicopters, and that's what I chose at, when I graduated from the basic. In the middle of your training, you get to decide which one you want to try to you know, take on. So I don't know. It was it was the adventure. It was uh, the challenge of I, well, it, it was also at West Point, they take you through various uh, different branch experiences while you're going to school there. And I figured out real fast, like during infantry week, when I was carrying like this hundred pound, like rucksack and like this really heavy uh, machine gun around for a week. And uh, it just, it was brutal. It wasn't something that I really enjoyed. <laughs> And uh, part of some of the training that you go through, you get an aviation flight like the we were out in the field and a helicopter comes in and lands and we climb into the helicopter and they fly us to this next location that would have taken us a week to get to. And I just remember being on the helicopter and I'm like, I don't know, 19 years old, 20 years old. And I was like, OK, yeah, this is what I want to do for sure. <laughs> wow. This isn't even hard. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how certain things capture us, like capture our hearts, that, mm -hmm. that spark our imagination and capture our, our, our being at some level. And I wonder if, I don't know if you've got a view on this, is there such a thing as destiny? Do we come onto the planet with a yearning or a desire for certain, are there certain desires that you think we're born with that, that mm. then get kind of triggered by our circumstances and we find ourselves pursuing them? Do you have a view on that? I, well, I guess my view would be, I think, uh, I think our thoughts actually are kind of like reciprocal with our environment. So, uh, if you are really wanting something bad, like for me, when I was in high school, I really wanted to go to a service academy. I 
I don't necessarily know why, um, but it was something that I was very determined to do. Um, I really liked the discipline and the order of it and the, uh, the challenge was really enticing to me because it seemed really difficult. And I saw other people that had done that. And I was just like really impressed by it all because it was so challenging. And um, so, you know, you think if, if you have a lot of uh, focal, like if, if you're thinking about it and you're really focused on it and you're, you're actually putting in the work, the proof of work to realize it. Um, I think the, I think the universe maybe has a way to supply that desire uh, through the environment back to the individual that continues to pump this this focal energy uh, through their thoughts into the environment around them. And people might hear that and think that that's a bunch of garbage, but uh, I guess I've just seen it play out in my own life multiple times through things that that I've wanted. And I think this is important to say too is. Um, I'm not real wishy-washy, like just my personality. Like I'm like, if there's something I really want to kind of go after, I can get really focused on it and like aggressively pursue it. And so maybe that's why it's kind of realized that it's the, the way it has in, in my own life. And uh, so I think there is, I think there is a little bit of what you're saying. I don't think that it's uh, necessarily predetermined before we show up here. Yeah. I think a little bit of it is is your environment shapes you, you shape your environment, and it's this back and forth uh, throughout your entire life that that's constantly at play. You you ended up seeing live action. You were you were stationed in Korea and also Afghanistan. You got a bronze mm -hmm. star in, for your service in Afghanistan. You were commanding a an attack helicopter company. Mm -hmm. Does anything prepare you for? <laughs> <laughs> not like, really. No. Yeah, not really. Um, yeah, I, I would just say uh, your, your training is really important in, in anything that you do in life, whether you're military or whatever, the more reps that you kind of run through your brain and your conditioning, your your yep. like a piano player, right? You can sit down and you can play the the best way to practice is just practice your left hand, practice your right hand, and you you do that over and over again. A lot of pianists will tell you that they do it before they go to bed at night. And what's happening is they're sleeping is their the neural net is, is rerunning that. And they can, they might have five mistakes at night. They wake up in the morning and they play it again and they played it flawlessly. And it's because your brain's there working on it all night. And that, that neural net is, is doing that. So when I think about how do you prepare for any type of situation, whether it's combat or, you know, uh, playing the piano. Um, it's the amount of reps. It's the way you practice. It's the, uh, the best you can do to simulate an environment that you're preparing for that can hopefully prepare you for what's about to happen. Now, specifically for combat, for me, um, there's nothing that can prepare you for, like for me, I was out there flying and the first time somebody's like, somebody's shooting at you, right? Yeah. Like, no matter how many times you think you can be prepared for that, for that moment, uh, you know, you can't control your heart rate. You can't control these things that get very emotional. Um, like I'm being attacked and I better do something about it to type moments. Um, the more that you experience them, the more used to it you get. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Kenny Florian is a, is a pretty well-known Bitcoiner MMA fighter. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that when that guy goes into the ring, he's not really, uh, too emotional about it. It's kind of like, Hey, I've been here. I've been in a, a million of these kind of fights and I'm, I'm ready to rumble. Whereas somebody who's never been in a fight before, they're going to practically make themselves pass out just from their hyperventilating as they're getting ready and prepared for, for what's about to happen. So, um, yeah, I would just I would describe it that way. There's a lot of things you can prepare for and you try to push into your subconscious as much as possible, but for the things that are, you know, difficult to overcome emotionally, there's no type of simulation you can put that through. What's your as you look back on that period in your life, how do you feel about it? What was your process whilst you were there? How do you feel about 
How do you feel about the military? How do you feel about, oh, look, there's so much we could get into here. Let's stick with the personal. Let's stick yeah. with um, how you remember your experiences and, and how it's left its mark on you. Yeah. Um, well, when I went to West Point, uh, you know, multiple decades ago, um, Bitcoin wasn't even a thing that existed. Um, yep. Sound, truly sound digital money wasn't even, you know, there were cypherpunks back then. Yeah. Uh, I think the cypherpunks go back to late eighties, maybe early nineties or something like that. Um, yeah. So they were, they were trying to do this. I didn't even understand. I mean, at that early point in my life, I didn't even understand uh, money at all. I didn't understand how uh, the dollar was just this dominant global reserve. I mean, I knew as an American, I was very privileged to, to grow up in this country. Um, but like the, the really deep stuff that we talk about as Bitcoiners all the time, I didn't understand any of that stuff. And um, I just had a, I had a calling to, to serve the nation and I had a calling. I really wanted to go to West Point for the challenge. Um, and so when I look back at the experience of then deploying into combat and fighting and uh, especially Afghanistan, you look back and you're like, okay, so sure. The, the twin towers, nine 11, the Taliban and, you know, allowed Al Qaeda to to crop up. You know, maybe there's there's a reason to go in there and take the Taliban out because of the attack that Al Qaeda did. But then you start to ask yourself real quick: It's like, okay, so at what point was that mission or that objective accomplished? Because yeah. it wasn't accomplished like in the 2020s when we were actually pulled out of there, like multiple uh, more than a decade and a half later um two decades right you have to ask yourself so like why why in the hell did it take that long and as a person who served and a person who's looking back at, at these extreme sacrifices and i would i would like to emphasize this the people who go over there and and perform this time away from their families is is a massive sacrifice but the real sacrifice is the families that are back home just having no idea what's happening or whether their husband is coming, like for my wife, right? Like she had no idea whether I was even going to come back, right? She had no idea. And there was people in our unit that did not come back, yeah. right? Those, those spouses, what they went through and the children, what they went through, like that sacrifice is... You can't even quantify it. Yeah. And so you're asking yourself, especially like later in the in the whole thing, and then Iraq and get into like the later portion of it, and you're asking yourself, so like, why are we actually here? Like, what is it, what is the real objective? Yeah. And uh, I don't have a good answer for you, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you, these people that that are banging on the industrial um defense uh side of things and talking about how that incentive structure is so insanely broke. And I would argue for all the NATO countries that are all participating in, in these activities where there's just this giant war machine that's constantly taking place, uh, it's pretty frustrating for me to observe. And I, I would tell you, Carrie, this is one of the reasons, if not the main reason, why I am so passionate about Bitcoin. Because it, I, I truly believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I truly believe that this fixes this really corrupt and mutilated incentive structure that exists between nation states. And you're actually operating off of a unit of account that doesn't require trust in that uh, any nation state, company, individual can exchange value with one another. And they don't have to worry about the other side adjusting the ledger of how many units their their local currency is operating off of and that's a game changer it's something that like i said when i went to west point it was something that didn't exist in the world it was it was uh you know i think people very few people a understood how important something like that would be and b 
had a belief structure that it could actually be created and discovered. And I think we discovered it. So there's two ways in which uh, I see Bitcoin impacts war as, as it's currently been waged or over the last, say, 100 years. Um, one is the money, the unfettered money supply that has, uh, that has obviously financed this kind of ongoing war that, that serves no one but themselves. Um, and B, there's this second element that's come in that's around sort of Jason Lowry's thesis and the way in which Bitcoin can be used as a defense in its own right, almost like as a moat around key information like a cybersecurity protocol. So as we move from hot war to, to cold war, if you like, mm -hmm. um, in, diff in, in different parts of society. So there's this kind of, well, two-pronged, and I'm sure it's much more than that. I'm sure it's multi-pronged. But can we just go down each of those tracks of how Bitcoin minimizes war? Yeah, and I would just, uh, you're, you're laying out how Bitcoin's actually kind of presenting multiple solutions to different problem sets. Yeah. And uh, there's, a, there's a fascinating book. It's called What Technology Wants by uh, Kevin Kelly. And he, I would strongly recommend if, if any of this is interesting to people, I would highly recommend people read it. I'll link book. to it in the show notes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's a great book. And it just, it talks about how technology presents itself throughout history at these moments in time that almost seems like it's trying to find a way mm -hmm. to present itself. And I would, I would say that's Bitcoin through and through. It is presenting itself at a time where it's desperately needed on multiple fronts. Uh, you know, anybody who's been on Twitter and has dealt with the bots, it's just, it is insane. And when we think about where AI is taking some of this stuff, where a person doesn't even have to know how to code anything, and they're standing up these bots that are scraping the network and just inundating resources because it's a resourcing uh just total tax on all the processing and storage and all that kind of stuff you need some type of technology that uh creates a, a digital wall of encrypted energy to prevent such an attack because it's really an attack uh to to consume all those resources and bitcoin is the only thing that I know that can actually provide that because you need something that can conduct micropayments uh, that to put a small charge on that pinging of that server over and over again, DOS attack effectively. Uh, and so that's, that's where Jason's uh, angle of like how he's looking at Bitcoin. And I completely agree with that. Uh, Michael Saylor talks about it quite a bit. Uh, Adam Back talks about some of these ideas and how it can be employed. And so, yeah, I mean, you could all of a sudden people start stop pinging your server when there's a really small micro cost and friction to, 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 uh, you know, request that data package, right? Yeah. So that's one solution from a technical standpoint where I came to Bitcoin. I didn't come to Bitcoin through that lens whatsoever. And it's interesting that Jason arrived through that lens because I didn't. I arrived through the lens through looking at traditional financial markets and looking at the bond market in particular and saying, this thing is, is literally going to melt down the world. It's so broke. Right. Jeff Booth comes at it from even a, a a different angle, right? He's looking at it from a technologist standpoint as a, as an entrepreneur. And he's looking at technology and he's saying, if we're debasing the currency by 2%, Sailor would say it's around seven to 8% on an annualized basis. That is, that is an exponential. And yep. if we're, if we're progressing technology at an exponential, you're eventually going to, to break the money itself, because the technology is so deflationary, meaning I can have a robot do what a human used to do. And so now what does that human do? Jeff was looking at it from that lens. I'm looking at it from the bond market and how it, 
the math doesn't make sense. Jason Lowry's looking at, and so you have these people in the community that are all kind of approaching why Bitcoin and why it's needed and why it's revolutionary from a slightly different vantage point, but it's an absolute must when you view it through each one of those lenses. And I think that's yeah. what makes the this, this space and the community and Bitcoin itself just so fascinating because there's other people that are looking at it from a completely different lens that I didn't even mention. And they're saying, this thing has to work. This thing has to come into existence. So let's go further down the track, if you don't mind, of the financing of war. So mm -hmm. I've got a couple of different questions going on around here. First of all, we've got the element of, of historically when we decoupled from gold and the capacity to print money to extend a war. So there's that kind of element of it. And, and I guess it, that leads into a question that I've got going on in my mind about how did you feel when you first understood that as you transitioned from the army and you were doing your what was a side hustle at the time, which was your investor podcast, which of course then became your main hustle and a, you know, number one, Amazon number one uh, podcast. So let's just go into, if you don't mind covering off your understanding of money printing and how it impacts war, and then also your personal kind of reaction to that. I would, I would uh, break this down into two different pieces. So the first one is like, if the public doesn't really realize that they're being taxed, uh, they're not going to be up in arms and upset about how the resources are being spent by, you name it, nation state. Um, and so that tax, you know, I, I agree with Sailor through and through. I think if you would do a compound annual growth rate on like the M2 money in the US, that would probably be a very accurate uh, way to assess the, inf the true inflation rate across the breadth of the entire economy, whether you're measuring asset price inflation or you're looking at consumer goods or, or any of that stuff. I would just say, look at the M2 money supply growth. It's going to be 7 to 8% over a long period of, of time. And that's truly the inflation rate. Like That's how much the money supply is, is growing. So if, if that's happening in the background, and that debasement is, is a major source of paying for war. You're not going to have a populace that's upset because they're just, they're just being duped. They're not seeing that showing up. Uh, let's say their tax rate is, is 25%. And if you weren't debasing the money, it might be as high as 35 or 45%, right? If you would raise those taxes on the people and say, hey, we're raising the taxes for the next five years by 20% to pay for this war because we're really mad at these people over here, you're probably not going to go to war. You're probably going to have the population to say, hey, no, don't do that. Like, I don't want to lose 20% of my uh, income to this tax to pay for this stupid war that I'm not even really upset about. So that's the first point. It's a hidden tax and it's a massive, massive tax because when you when you do the math and it's 7% annually, when you look at what that would be in, uh, in revenue, tax revenue, it's different than 7%. It's like way bigger than, than that when you're looking at how much of a portion that would be if the person was the, the corporation or the individual was paying that bill. So th that's the first point. The second point that I would make is you got to really look at the incentive structure of, of war. So I can only talk to the U.S., but I would imagine a lot of the G7 countries, NATO countries that are uh, all participating in this, it would be very similar. So the, the elected officials here in the U.S., the, the people in Congress, the, the senators and representatives, they're the ones that uh, get to make decisions on where all the, the military industrial complex spent their money. Um, so let's say uh, the Army or the Air Force want to build, or the Air Force is a great example because this is such a big ticket item. Look at the F-35. Huge program, massive program, to, uh, trillions of dollars over the life cycle of, of the program. Um, so the Air Force says, hey, we want to build this new swoop D jet. They have to go to the congressional uh, elected officials, and they have to brief them on how that resourcing is being spent. And so the, 
the elected officials that sit on that on that committee, on the defense budget committee, what do you think that they're concerned with? They're obviously want to they want to see technical progress on the jet being developed, but they're also very very interested in which district that work is being performed. Right? Very interested because we're talking about trillions of dollars over the over the life cycle of the program. And if those if those dollars are being spent into their district, you don't think that they're incentivized to make sure that that program doesn't get killed, even if it's like performing in a mediocre kind of way. Right. And uh, so so you get into this incentive structure that is very broke and uh, very manipulated and uh, disinterested, like the interests aren't necessarily aligned. And so. um it's really important for people to look at things through that lens when they're thinking about the war machine and they're thinking about, uh, because acquisition, the, the, the procurement of material is an enormous, the biggest part of the bill for, for military uh, defense. It's not right. actually paying the people to actually go into combat. That bill is actually not nearly as big as people would think it is. The real bill is building all of this technical equipment and upgrading all this technical equipment and then which districts that money flows into and the people that get to sit on this board. And then these people, they don't have term limits right here in the US. So you want you want me to solve a problem real fast? Did you just you put a lottery on uh if if you don't pass a balanced budget, there's this lottery system that uh people are are they're done. They cannot serve anymore. Right. And maybe the lottery is 20 to 30 percent of the elected officials. Just there. That's it. That's your last uh, that's your last term. You have to uh, you, you, you aren't eligible after this term because you didn't pass a balanced budget. And the, every year that it's not a balanced budget, then the next 30 percent randomly are selected and they're not allowed. You'd solve things real fast if that was the case or yeah. just implement term limits in general. And you, you would really get. A lot of this out of the way. Now, I can't speak to other nation states, but I, I suspect it's probably a really similar incentive structure that is really breaking down. And this is a function of fiat. This is a function of not having money that's actually backed by some type of commodity that's that's scarce and desirable. Um, when you can just log into a computer and do a couple keystrokes and all of a sudden there's an extra tr trillion dollars in the banks and then that flows out into the economy through quantitative easing into the hands of people that own assets, which are the high net worth individuals. Um, and then it just trickles down, right? Yes. Uh, which it doesn't. That's the cotillion effect. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is the issue. This is the problem. And you see this really percolate and become obvious later in the game and that's why everybody's talking about it right now that's why you got the ceo of blackrock saying uh bitcoin and hope in this kind of the same sentence um the, like all of this stuff really you don't you don't see it when you initially come off of this gold standard at least whenever you're the global settlement layer it takes time it, it takes decades for this thing to really kind of percolate out yeah okay was there as you delved kind of deeper and deeper into money and investments and ultimately Bitcoin and kind of in the history of money, et cetera, was there almost a sense of betrayal at some point along the way? Um, no, I would, yeah. I, what I would say is if Bitcoin didn't come along, right, let's say that it, it wasn't solved or that the person who, who solved it was, uh, still influencing it and it wasn't actually decentralized you kind of came up with this broken thing and and we would be looking at some very very dark days ahead yeah. very dark days ahead and we'd be dealing with a future that would resemble our past and uh you know when you look at the last 80 years uh i would say up to 2020 mm -hmm. uh that that the U.S. experienced, and I can only speak from the U.S. and some of the other major economies. It was a it was a pretty uh, relative to five hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. It was a pretty good uh, it was a pretty good run for those for citizens in those countries. 
Now you get into some of the uh, in Alex Gladstein's writing on the yeah. IMF and World Bank and and really kind of the bill payers for the beneficiaries of that system over the last eighty years. It was a pretty rough. Uh, it was a, it was a pretty rough century, because from their vantage point, things just continued to get worse with respect to their ability to um, really kind of compete on a global scale and um, the corruption was really kind of incentivized and you'd have to read his work to really kind of understand why I'm saying that. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying one is good or one is bad. I guess I'm just looking at it in the context of you didn't have a technology that was immutable and unmanipulatable and sound and saleable and portable and all of these things that, that never existed. So for us to have it now and look back at history and say, like, just, just to kind of like exemplify my point, let's go back to the Roman era. We, yeah. could, we could look at them and say, well, they didn't have Bitcoin. They were heathens, right? Like, why didn't they have Bitcoin, <laughs> right? Like the example is a little bit more uh, obvious when you go back 2000 years and you look at them. Well, clearly they didn't have yeah. smartphones. They didn't have all these other things. But we didn't have the technology for this 20 years ago either, right? So it's not that I'm looking back at, at what I went through with this hatred or animosity. It was just a function of, of that moment in time and what the world knew and what we had discovered. And uh, now, if, if I would look at where I'm at now and not be a proponent of Bitcoin, knowing what I know, mm -hmm. well, then... That's a that's a pretty sad situation, and you know what? There's there are people out there, especially in in finance and economics. Mm. I think they do understand some of this stuff, and I think of, because of where they sit and because of their personal incentive structure, uh, whether that's a hedge fund or whatever, they're saying, "Oh, I hope this fails." These people are, you know, and 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 th th those are the people I have issues with. Yeah, because they're, yep. they're trying to I prevent pro progress from a global you know, humanitarian standpoint. They're just selfish, they're parasites. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure we could name names. Um, one I don't <laughs> want to necessarily put in that basket, but who has an interesting point of view is Sultan Pazza. Um, he, mm -hmm. He's talking about Bretton Woods 3. He's talking mm -hmm. about going back to some sort of, well, I think you're seeing it with the BRICS nations looking for some sort of commodity backed currency in which to trade. They don't necessarily trust each other's currencies. I mean, do we all want to hold on to the Russian rubles? I don't know that Brazil is that enamored with, with holding uh, Russian rubles. So the idea of moving towards some sort of commodity or mixture of commodities, perhaps based currency, is emerging in discussions at the moment. Uh, and yet Zoltan doesn't seem to be a proponent or doesn't seem to be a holder of uh, Bitcoin. Why do you think that is? Have you actually crossed paths with him? Do you know anything? Uh, so I do you have, know him at a personal level? I do not know him on a personal level, but I will say this. I'm a big fan of his writing and I'm a big fan of his just economic thoughts. I think yep. he's a very, very smart man um, and probably understands the global plumbing better than anybody out there. Yeah. Uh, the large flow of funds that, that happen from a fractional reserve system which is very difficult to wrap your head around. Uh, Lynn's, mm -hmm. Lynn's up there with, with Zoltan, in, in my opinion, with just their, their understanding of that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for me to kind of pontificate on why he doesn't necessarily, why he's not like a hardcore Bitcoiner. Um, because everything that he writes suggests that he should be. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I had to guess, right, if I had to guess, uh, I would probably say it's probably similar to maybe why Dalio doesn't necessarily, why he's not a hardcore Bitcoiner, even though he says he, he owns some. Um, I would, I would uh, chalk it up to two things. I would say uh, they probably are having a hard time wrapping their head around the technical piece of it and trusting it from a technical piece that there's not some bug in it or yeah. Uh, you know, you talk to somebody who's not an engineer or somebody who's ever dealt with software engineering much, and they just... Like, hell, my email got hacked. Like, 
what if the whole protocol got hacked is kind of where they're at from a technical standpoint. And it's really hard for them to get over no, this hurdle because they don't have the technical chops to, to really go deep on the line of questioning to, to arrive there. Now, could they? Of course, but it doesn't seem like they have. The second uh, thing that I would say, and this is more attributed to Ray, um, he seems to have a perception that the state has a has a lot more influence and power on this on on how to disrupt the technology and disrupt the protocol than uh, a hardcore person who studied it a lot. In, in my opinion, right? Um, Ray has this wave of the hand that the state could shut it down if they really wanted to. Right. And I think I think the state. I I think to to Ray's point. I think let's say the U.S. or the European Union or whoever, right? Could they really like s- slow things down and, and lock it down pretty tight for a while? I think they could. I think they yep. could. They could shut down these exchanges. I think they could. But what they can't do, and this is the thing where I don't think that their game theory is accurate, is they could slow it down for five or ten years, but they're still not going to stop the train. Because there's definitely going to be countries like El Salvador and others that that have already made it legal tender. And um, with enough time, it's going to the game theory is going to force such a participant to adopt it. And so that's where I'm looking at Ray and I'm like, dude, how can't you see the game theory on this? Like, uh, so I think Zoltan and uh, Ray and when you look at people that are deeply indoctrinated into traditional Wall Street finance, they kind of, I think, end up in one of those two camps where they just have so much faith. And I think because in, uh, Michael Saylor does a great job talking about how the closer you are to politics when you're managing these massive flows of buying power in traditional finance, uh, you you really have to be an expert at uh, making sure that you use uh, bureaucrats as a weapon to your advantage, uh, that you wield them around almost like a sword or a saber uh, to get what you want because they're, they, they control so much buying power that they can, they can do such a thing. And anybody who doesn't think that they can do that, they don't understand how the game works. Um, you know, I would, uh, Michael just gave a, a speech over in Europe recently where he basically gave a great 30 minute talk on this particular area. I'd highly encourage people to check out that talk if, if they want to, you know, maybe challenge or, or learn more about why I feel that way. But hey, guys, Kerry C here from Bitcoin People. I hope you're enjoying the show. If you are getting value from it and you're finding it entertaining or interesting or informative or a little bit of all of the above, please consider supporting the show by way of a number of different options. Simply liking and subscribing to the show or even writing a comment from time to time if you find something of particular interest. All of that helps to support the algorithm on YouTube. If you'd like to donate some sats to supporting the costs of the show, that would be tremendous as well. We've got a lightning address down in the description. And finally, if you are a business and you would like some exposure to the Bitcoin community, please reach out and get in touch. We'd love to have a chat with you about sponsoring the show. Wishing you well. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I look forward to being in touch. All the best. Um, which makes a great deal of sense. And it's actually the first time I've heard it explained that way. I'm going to come back to a war analogy for a moment. Um, on one hand, it feels like, well, we talk about in the Bitcoin community, particularly Jeff Booth, as this being a kind of quiet revolution. Others see it as more of a war from, mm-hmm. you know, the plebs, but, but the kind of the working class on the middle class versus the elite being the political and financial class. Do you perceive it that way? And if so, again, I'm doing a double barreled question, but do you strategize around that? And then I've got a second Uh, question to follow up. So I would actually describe what's happening as a global debt jubilee. And when you study economic history, there's always a debt jubilee with any currency throughout time. Uh, 
I would I would argue the rate at which debt jubilees happen is like every 40 to 50 years uh, when you go back and you study your history. Uh, so this one's well overdue. Um, yeah. You, I don't know that you've ever seen it on a global scale, but you have definitely seen it with superpowers or really strong nations that they go through debt jubilees. And so you have to you have to go back to this fundamental question. Why do you always see debt jubilees throughout history? Why does that happen? And it's because the credit markets eventually get to a point where they can't handle the manipulation of the currency that rides on top of the the gold ledger because there's manipulation there that's been hidden and um and it goes to jeff's thesis when they're manipulating the ledger and there's more currency riding on top of the gold than what actually exists you incentivize technology growth you incentivize the consolidation of enterprise you manifest you can bring that inflation down but then all of a sudden there's this release that happens because everything's been consolidated into the hands of only a few participants in the economy just like there is today um you have very few people that control all of the equity and all the buying power in the world and so in this reset that's happening you know you can call it a revolution you can call it whatever whatever you want right i i think uh one of the ones i like is it's it's the uh well what was the wall street uh in 2008 the people in the park uh oh the, the um uh what's the name wall street um occupy occupy wall street yes yeah so you had the occupy wall street i i argue that this is occupy wall street but with actual like meat and action behind it not some a bunch of people sitting in a park singing folk songs saying they're upset with the system this is action this yeah. is a solution to the problem yeah. and so um you know I, I think it could go under a bunch of different names but i for me personally i would just say this is a reset of the credit this is a reset of the equity okay this is a reset of the, the ownership of equity yeah. and you have a very f- few people pulling the strings of, of the ownership of all this equity and so what you're going to the way this is going to play out is you're going to have Bitcoiners, when you look at, at the fact that 70% of the Bitcoin haven't moved in over a year, even though it's down pretty, yeah. pretty hard, right? From the top of, call it 70,000 to where we're at at 30,000 right now. You still have 70% of those coins that haven't moved in the last year. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of person is holding that? What, what kind of crazy person doesn't sell <laughs> through that price movement? Well, it's a person who understands what's happening. And it's a person who knows that in the reset, that those units that can't be manipulated, there's a fixed supply of them, are going to be worth way more than what they are right now in those fiat terms. Okay. Yeah. So you get, to, you get to a point through this reset that people like me and some others that understand how economic calculation is performed, they're willing to give up their units because they're willing to buy equity that is denominating their free cash flows in Bitcoin. And it actually makes more Bitcoin than the current present value of it for the risk that's being assumed by foregoing those Bitcoin to own the equity. And this is all just you know basic uh, economic calculation. For example, right? If there's a company and they're not they're any free cash flow that they make, they immediately turn it into Bitcoin, uh, like a micro strategy, right? Yeah. And they save it. Um, if that company is producing twenty, if if I look at that and I do an internal rate of return calculation based on what it's trading for, and this is in Bitcoin terms, and I'm saying that's a twenty percent return on an yeah. annualized basis based on that price that I can buy it for today. Carry, I'll probably sell some of my Bitcoin to own a company like that. And that hurdle rate pro- for me personally is probably going to have to be in excess of 20% after I do the calculation. And I can yeah. tell you today, there's no companies that, that meet that criteria for me. So I hold Bitcoin. Yeah. And so whether people understand that that's the calculation they're doing, the, I think the, the people that hold a majority of the Bitcoin as we're going through this transition 
uh, of the legacy system to this new system, they are going to be able to do that calculation and they're going to start making those decisions at a certain hurdle rate of whatever percent. I would I would suggest it's probably going to be around 20%. Yep. Um, they're going to start. And so what you're going to see is that equity is going to reshuffle itself into legacy hands into this whole new crop of very smart capital allocators that are then going to yeah. hold the equity. Gotcha. So the concern that would naturally arise there is we've already got Michael Saylor as one of the kind of biggest um, uh, Bitcoin holders in the world. We've got uh, BlackRock, obviously, talking about uh, an ETF, and I understand that to be a spot ETF. So mm -hmm. there's no reason why Bitcoin couldn't also consolidate into the hands of a chosen few. And particularly if people do start selling over time, even if it's 50 years from now, that could, you know, BlackRock has got a long lifespan and can be just gobbling up all the little bits as it goes. Then you add into the equation potentially AI and what AI can be doing to uh, gobble up uh, sort of Bitcoin as it comes onto the secondary market from miners. Uh, so there's that. How do you perceive that as as a as a concern? Well, so from the consolidation of the the holders of it, you I think you're going to actually see an enormous amount of shuffling of that equity into to make it more spread out throughout throughout the world because of this exchange that's going to be happening due to economic calculation of all these Bitcoiners to legacy where all the buying power currently rests today is in debt markets. That's where majority of the of the buying power is, is in debt markets. That yeah. goes to zero. Yeah. It literally goes to zero. <laughs> so um, you talk about a reset, you talk about a debt jubilee, that's, that's it. Um, then you talk about the equity. That equity is flowing into definitely a lot of new hands than where it's currently resting right now. So that's where you get the reset. That's where you get, um, and, and let's not forget, so many businesses today are zombies. The only yeah. reason these businesses exist is because the, the fiat printing press is, is alive and well and feeding it. Yeah. And um, with this, that goes away. And so if you're a business, I mean, just look at the look at the uh, the VC space, right? How many of these companies go to an IPO and are profitable? Like none of them. Yeah. Like it's just all like, we'll just drive the top line, we'll dump it into the public markets, and then the, you know, who cares what happens at that point, whether it even makes money ever. Um, and so that whole charade which is highly based on the printing press and the, the powers that be that are controlled that get first bite at the apple on all this printing. It goes yeah. straight into these like really high risk areas because, you know, you got a couple billion, like, why not? Like, you can afford to be really risky when you got that much buying power it, behind you. Um, and so that's why you've seen so much of this VC take off, this VC space take off in the last 20 years is it's a function of that. And so you're, you're snuffing that out with Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot Absolutely. of that goes away. Yeah. Absolutely. So Luke Roman's talking about uh, treasury bonds becoming fundamentally a risk on ac asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the market is increasingly perceiving them that way. Mm -hmm. Do which you I totally, see a point? I totally which, agree with. <laughs> yeah, which I totally I, agree. And understandably. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm curious. I mean, we've talked about people like Zoltan and Ray. Um, they've got to start seeing that. They they are seeing that. Mm -hmm. At what point do you think there's? Is there just a tipping point at some point where people see? Uh, Bitcoin start is is there like a just a, a mass movement and then a tipping point where suddenly Bitcoin is seen as the risk off asset and it decouples yeah I think you're I think you're way closer to that than than most would ever admit um, because it's it's a really risky thing to say that and I'm just looking at it and I'm just looking at the the yield curves and I'm saying none of them have demonstrated any type of slowing down of the sell off out of fixed income. And uh, it doesn't mean it can't happen, uh, but 
if something really kind of starts falling apart, which could totally happen before the end of this year, could totally, it doesn't mean it will. It's just the probabilities are there. It could happen. If it does, and they have to come to the market with five or 10 trillion or whatever to, to try to add liquidity into this fractional reserve system that's based on credit that explodes in, in impairment, that's part of this fractional reserve system is that trillions can just disappear overnight because of impairment. Um, if they have to step in and, and plug that with, with additional uh, printing, you're, I don't know how your tre your treasury market, the bond yield curves, can hold hold where they're at. I, I think they sell off even harder because I think the whole market's looking at that and saying they have none of this under control. They've just doubled the amount of stimulus that they added since the COVID. Like, supposedly that was from COVID and not anything else, right? Um, people think that 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 was an unprecedented action and that it was a one-off kind of thing. I would say it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be more of the same. And I think the next go around is actually going to be that and maybe more. And if that's the case, like, and you're holding bonds, like good luck. Like, I don't know how you can think that inflation is not going to go double digits, especially in Europe, especially in Europe. I mean, <laughs> especially in Europe. So yeah. how does the how do, how does the yield yeah, curve please. demonstrate single digits? If you're a double digit inflation, it doesn't make any sense. It's a contract right. guaranteed to lose money, and uh, you get you get in this situation where you're in the spiral. And um, I kind of you know I kind of think you're in it. I think we're at the very start of it, and uh, I think over the coming five years we're going to fully express it. And um, and yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> five years, you reckon? Okay. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of folk really feeling this is very imminent now. And what I mean by imminent mm -hmm. is within the next five years. Um, whereas, you know, I think we've seen this can kick down the road for such a long time. And yet the sense of it's almost palpable at the moment, the sense of it, it's really happening now. Um, do you, how do you see that meltdown playing out? How do you see this kind of at a at a practical level? I mean, I guess for day in and day out people, for the people who follow you on the investor podcast, mm -hmm. um, are they coming on board? Have they your traditional finance listeners come on board with Bitcoin as you have? Have they come on that journey with you? And how do the rest of us prepare? And how do you see it playing out? Some have, some haven't, um, and you know, and when we, we want people to get it when when they want to get it, and we want people to uh, ask the hard questions. We want people to be skeptical, and just because I love it doesn't mean that I'm right, and it doesn't mean that you have to love it as well. So, like, we're very open to uh, people that you know. We we just hope that they approach it with an open mind and that they give it a shot to try, to listen to some of the con. Uh, some of the content and really kind of challenge maybe their belief structure. And just because Buffett says it's rat poison, that they don't write it off, that it's rat poison, that they give us a, a shot to, to maybe convince them otherwise. Um, in addition to that, uh, how does it play out? Well, uh, if you're looking for the hyperinflation to to manifest itself in a way where you're comparing the dollar to the euro or whatever. I don't think you're going to see it there. I think Bitcoin is the gauge. So if Bitcoin goes to 200,000, you should be asking yourself why. If it goes mm -hmm. to a million, you should really be asking yourself why. Uh, if it goes much higher than that and you're not owning it, um, you might have less buying power than you had before that event horizon. Um, so, uh, and that's going to be a really hard thing psychologically for people to wrap their head around because I think the higher it goes, everybody's accustomed to this because they've never lived through a situation like this, at least not uh, major G7 type countries haven't lived through something like this. But um, if you've never lived through something like this and you see something go crazy hyperbolic like that, uh, the the first inclination is well, I'll just wait for it to drop back down before I buy right. it. And yeah. what they don't necessarily understand is that when it's at five hundred thousand, what the market is telling you is this is the new settlement layer. 
this this is the how you need to be valuing everything you look at on the planet now is through this lens and yeah. because maybe they have repeated to themselves that bitcoin's a scheme or it's a scam or it's whatever those you know really lazy arguments are um, mm -hmm. If you've told yourself that enough times, you you might have conditioned yourself to believe that it's that thing, and you might actually be angry that it's at five hundred thousand, or upset with a person who's owned it since it was two hundred dollars, as opposed to trying to understand why they bought it at two hundred dollars. Uh, and that might be a difficult pill for people to swallow and to think about. Um, yeah, I when when your when your bank is making these a bank that you would never have, have suspected would even talk about Bitcoin and that they're making these things for your accounts to swap some of your savings into Bitcoin, like automatically when your traditional banks doing that, hang on. Cause that, is that happening? I think it's, I think it's uh, around the corner. I think that you're going to see that in the coming five years. And I think that when people see that they're going to be like, what the heck? And it's going to be a little alarming. And uh you know that's those these are these are the the um the marks in the timeline that you really need to pay attention to and and ask yourself okay uh that's interesting right yeah <laughs> that's something to pay attention to why are they offering this service Absolutely. Okay. What do you think the political response is going to be as things start to get out of control? As we know, they're going to want to minimize civil unrest. Mm -hmm. um, nobody, no government wants to invite what France has currently got going on. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, what we might see in the way of um, uh, climate change, emergency lockdowns, etc.? What, uh, uh, I, I think the challenge is, have you thought through that? I think once the, the majority of the populace starts to understand it, it's going to be everybody running for the exits and there's only one exit in the theater and the theater's on fire type situation is what you're, you're going to see. And, um, and I don't know how they're going to handle that politically. I don't know how, uh, the, for me, this this past what was it two weeks ago when BlackRock filed for their ETF, their Bitcoin ETF, and then Fidelity updated theirs. And you think about how much buying power these banks are controlling. I mean, uh, BlackRock's a ten trillion, ten trillion dollar asset under management firm. If you took all the taxes in the United States for a year, Every single company, to include Apple, Google, all of them, right? You took all their taxes for the year. It's it's only five trillion dollars, Carrie. So the fact that this bank that manages ten trillion dollars is filing for a Bitcoin ETF and not and not the other altcoins, right? And you literally had Larry Fink on uh, mainstream news today talking about bitcoin and the word hope in the same sentence like people need to wake up people need to wake up like this isn't and, and this is the same guy that said that bitcoin was for uh what was the word he used uh yeah. it's for like it nefarious funny. activities and like laundering an money index, is the word he used. an index for criminal activity or something it, Yes, this was three years ago, four years Yet. ago. This guy, this guy was literally saying this on the news, and now he's using it in the same sentence as the word hope, which you go to hope.com and it's Michael Saylor's whole webpage about Bitcoin, right? So maybe Larry was maybe Larry was hanging out on Michael's website before he went and took the interview. I don't know, but I find it coincidental. Uh so I, where were we going with the question? <laughs> I think I <laughs> got off on um, a tangent. Who knows? I think we were talking about the tipping point and we were talking about yeah. the political or government backlash from that because they're not going to go down without a fight. So this is where I was going with this. So, um, you know, I don't, I am so political agnostic. It actually uh, drives me crazy if people think I'm one party or the other. Like, I am so far removed from either one of these parties because i think they're both idiots <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that how dare you try to say i'm this one or that one um but 
So uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, a Democrat, has been very vocal about how she thinks Bitcoin, crypto, all of it is is very corrupt and, and this and that, right? She's from Massachusetts and highly connected to big bankers uh, that fund her. Uh, I think I suspect, and I don't know, I, I might be dead wrong about this, but if she came out and was all of a sudden pro Bitcoin, like it would not surprise me in the least bit because you've now had Larry Fink and uh, the Wall Street elite start to get behind it. And think about it. Larry Fink has been one of the biggest ESG proponents of all time. Like the whole ESG WEF thing is like Larry's thing. Like truly, like he's one of the biggest guys behind this whole ESG stuff. And he's rolling out a Bitcoin ETF and saying it's hope on live TV. And so like, where's the whole mining uh, angle that it's, you know, wasting energy and no mention, right? It's just like it magically disappeared all of a sudden out of nowhere. So um, I think you're going to find that every political candidate, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on, is now going to be pro-Bitcoin. And I think they're going to be pro-Bitcoin because the, the bankers are now pro-Bitcoin. Well, and there's nothing they can do about it. And it's getting talked about and it's getting regulated. There seems to be a momentum now. And maybe this is part of, I guess, what they call the Lindy effect is the more it's around and the more it gets talked about and the more seriously it gets taken by some sectors of the economy, the more the more secure it makes it over and above kind of the building out of the node network and the minor network, et cetera, simply the social contagion of it, the, the, the social uptake of it. Um, creates a Lindy effect in its own right. I, uh, yeah. When you're when you think about, I I believe they threw everything in the kitchen sink at this thing for the past year to include the whole SBF, uh, FTX fiasco. Like, I'm sorry, there is way too many weird coincidences. Like when you read into some of that stuff, to not think yeah. that there were outside parties and things involved to tr to try to like just torch this entire space. Um, so they threw everything they had at this thing. And here we are at 30,000. I think it's up 80% on the year mm -hmm. for 2023, somewhere in that number. And they've literally tried to decapitate it. And it's up 80% on the year. It's the best performing thing in any, anywhere you look for 2023. And I think they're, they're saying, all right, well, we can't defeat this thing. Like this thing's a monster. That if we cut off the head, another three grow, not just one more, like three or four more grow. And they're saying, we've got to join it. We've got to join. I think that's what we're seeing right now is where we're seeing uh, they, they fought us. And now I think you're slowly starting to see, hey, maybe some of them are starting to join us. And I think they're starting to realize that if, if they're not buying it and telling their friends that they're not buying it, but they are buying it, they're not doing that right now. Uh, they're going to be left in the dust. There's, uh, and I know that shrimps and, and crabs are out there stacking like crazy at the moment because <laughs> there's this kind of sense of FOMO in the air at 30,000 and that technical analysis of the, the breakthrough of the 30,000 point and everyone's trying to get in before it potentially takes off. Um, so that feels, I guess, more hopeful and more excited than I felt for a little while. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting it's really important i think as a community i had this conversation with andy and actually also with um a gentleman from namibia before i spoke to andy uh the, the you know if we're not careful we just recreate the old system because human nature is human nature and so the need to stay very grounded and very aligned in our values and what matters as we build out on this network and as Bitcoin is adopted more broadly. And so the values just get, you know, watered down at some level in as much as you've got big players in the market and now it's just a mainstream asset. Uh, and so I feel like there's something about needing to stay very grounded and very still you know, to be very uh, clear and calm through the turmoil that we see ahead of us as things get disrupted financially, as with the exuberance that might come on board as 
Bitcoin potentially takes off under these circumstances. So you've got these kind of counterforces, this kind of chaos on the one hand and order potentially coming in under it at the other at the other end. Um, and that feels like it could be at the social level very, very disruptive and it could get very noisy out there on Twitter and in the world and on the streets. Um, and I don't really know if there's a question coming out of this, but I guess my question is, what do you do to keep yourself really grounded and really calm in the space of when things are really tumultuous? I get off Twitter. <laughs> Smart move, but, but I did see you. I did see your tweet earlier today. You retweeted someone. Well, I guess I guess my point is there's there. I don't care who you are. You're gonna have moments in this space where you get discouraged, or you just there's like how in the world can where, where I get most discouraged is if the Nasdaq or the S and P is ripping and it's up two percent or two and a half percent, and Bitcoin is down on the day. Those are the hardest days for me to handle psychologically. Um, and so I just, you know, you just have to get off of the, this is a long-term play, right? Yeah. You find something that you think has tremendous value. You continue to buy it. You dollar cost average it. You don't try to overthink it. You don't try to like time things and get fancy with it. Uh, I think Michael said, you know, it's kind of a form of, a, of an intelligence test, whether you're trading it or buying it to own it forever. And uh, I totally agree with him. Uh, don't get fancy with it. You, there's not there's not much you have to do. You don't have to have a huge position size. Like if you if you can't uh, if, if you can't uh, internalize all the knowledge that's required to to have a lot of confidence in it, well, then you need to scope down your position size, or else you just sell it when it when it gets too volatile. Um, people just need to stick to the basics and not overthink it, and just realize that it's a long term thesis based off of fiat currency melting down. And if that's not your thesis, and and you're not looking at it through that lens that it's a long term play, uh, good luck to you because I can't help you on the trading front. You've done a lot of personal development over the years. I've, you know, you've spoken to people like Tony Robbins. I've heard you talk about sort of Jim Rohn and, and you know, as a man thinketh and, you know, various books mm -hmm. and, and podcasts and people you've spoken to. If you could distill your, your greatest lesson in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, I mean, you've got 12 lessons in your book, but if there's one or two major morals to the story uh, or codes that you live by, what would they be? I think one of the, the best pieces of advice I can give people is you're programming yourself, is you uh, be careful what you think and definitely be careful what you believe. Because you will manifest it, like you will bring it into your reality. And uh, all day long, you got thoughts running around in your head, all day long. And um, if you're not if you're not thinking about what those thoughts are, and trying to prune them, it's almost like a bonsai tree, right? You can let the thing just grow all over the place, or you can prune it in a certain way that you want it to look. And um, your life is a representation of how you're trying to prune your reality. And uh, it, it's all through your thoughts. It's all the things that you, and if, you're, if you think something a lot, that is going to become a, a, a deep held belief. And you're going to manifest it somehow, some way. The universe is going to find a way to make sure that you realize it. Uh, so, you know, uh, as an example, like if you look at your, if you look at one of your kids and you're like, they're so disrespectful and you say that over and over again, they're going to be disrespectful. They're, you're going to, you're going to cognitively program them to believe that they are disrespectful and that you view them optically as being disrespectful. Um, I would just say that, uh, pay attention to your thoughts, prune your thoughts. Uh, focus your energy and, um, and if you find something that you think can make the world a better place, 
by, by through efficiency or happiness or whatever that might be, and you don't act on it, then what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> right? Like find that thing and then focus your energy and focus your thoughts and believe to your core. And you might, it might be really hard for you to believe whatever it is initially. And, you know, Jim Rowan or Tony can, are great books that, that can kind of help a person get behind how they can actually believe what they're trying to manifest through their thoughts. But you have to actually believe it. And when you do, when you actually believe that, you will manifest it. It will happen. So. That's a lovely note to finish on. Um, Preston, really an honor to meet you. Thank you for your Likewise. generosity of spirit and time Likewise. in being here. It's been you. just a privilege to have you on board. Thank you so much. And it was so wonderful meeting you in, in Miami. And you. All the best. So I had no idea uh, about the fiat system uh, around the wheels and stuff like that. And me trying to solve all that problems at that time, uh, understood a lot of stupid things actually are written in law that does not protect the heirs. And because of all that pain period from 2014 to 2017, I really realized the benefits of the Bitcoin will when I uh, started studying it in 2021.